we can move forward as a country and, and, and embrace the notion that we're all going to be judged not on the color of our skin, but on the content of our character, and in this case, on our GPA. Am I understanding you saying there in that answer that you do not believe there is racial inequity in the education system in America? I, I just, I, I really don't believe there is. I believe there was. I mean, it's, it's, there may have been a time when affirmative action uh, was necessary simply to open the doors uh, of all of our schools and universities. But I think that time has passed and we'll continue to move forward as a, as a colorblind society. A colorblind society. That concept was the central struggle of the Supreme Court's decision to strike down race conscious admission policies last week. Now, on the campaign trail and elsewhere, the takeaway seems to be we have achieved some kind of colorblind nirvana that race conscious solutions to systemic social inequities actually disenfranchise white people. So we should be race neutral or colorblind, like presidential candidate Mike Pence suggests. To bolster this argument in the court's majority opinion last week, Chief Justice John Roberts cited Jim Crow era Justice John Marshall Harlan, a man often called the great dissenter. Roberts pointed to a specific section of Harlan's dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896 as a separate but equal case. Harlan wrote, quote, our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. And in part, for that reason, the court found affirmative action in violation of the 14th, the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. But that Roberts' majority opinion happened to skip this part of Harlan's 1896 dissent. Right before the colorblind Constitution sentence, Harlan writes, quote, the white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country, and so it is, in prestige, in achievements, in education, in wealth, and in power. So I doubt not it will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage and holds fast to the principles of constitutional liberty. A colorblind Constitution on one hand and a quote, dominant race on the other, two diametrically opposed concepts on the same page. So this contradiction was actually laid bare in a new Atlantic piece co-authored by Ibram X. Kendi, author of How to Raise an Anti-Racist and founder of Boston University's Center for Anti-Racist Research. Dr. Kendi writes, quote, the colorblind often see their color as superior, as Harlan did. In the actual world, an equal protection clause in a constitution can be transfigured by legal fantasy, yet again, to protect racial inequity. History repeats sometimes without rhyming. Race neutral is the new separate but equal. Then the fantasy was that separate facilities for education afforded to the races were equal and that actions to desegregate them were unnecessary, if not harmful. Today, the fantasy is that regular college admissions metrics are race neutral and that affirmative action is unnecessary, if not harmful. Now that racial neutrality is the doctrine of the land as separate but equal was a century ago, we need a new legal movement to expose its fantastical nature. Well, joining us now is Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, professor and founding director of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University. Dr. Kendi, thank you so much for, for being here. And I appreciate you writing that piece, because I'm trying to make this case to my team over the weekend. And they were like, hmm, I don't know. I said, well, somebody going to write it. And you definitely did. Uh, Black and Latino students, they are still underrepresented in many of our country's most selective public universities. But the Supreme Court believes that we are ready for a race neutral or even a colorblind approach to admissions that excludes affirmative action. You call this a legal fantasy in the Atlantic. Why is it a legal fantasy? I think it's best to contextualize it uh, how it was a century ago, in, in which you had uh, those litigants who were trying to desegregate uh, schools who uh, were going up to the Supreme Court, and that Supreme Court was was telling them that these schools were separate but equal, even though study after study showed uh, that Black schools were receiving far and away less resources from states like Mississippi and, and, and Georgia and South Carolina than, than segregated white schools. But similarly, today, you, you, you have uh, Supreme Court justices claiming uh, that uh, the only race-based admissions factor is affirmative action. But as you've already talked about, if you look at legacies, that provides uh, racial preferences for, for white students. The same thing with, for instance, children of employees. White people are overrepresented 
uh, on the staff and faculty of, of colleges and, and universities. So that gives preferences to their uh, to their children. Uh, it also includes white people are more likely to donate to these institutions and, and the relatives of donors also get a boost in admissions, even standardized tests, uh, which primarily show the wealth or the income that, of the parents of the test takers. And we have a massive racial wealth gap. So to me, it's, it's a fantasy uh, that we have race neutrality other than admit affirmative action, just like it was a fantasy a century ago that the, the schools were separate but equal. So you write that we need a, a new legal movement to expose race neutral neutrality as a, a fantasy. What is the, the new legal movement? Well, I, I think it starts with uh, your previous guest, who is is, is actually demonstrating uh, that that legacy is actually not a, quote, race neutral, that it actually gives preferences to white students. And, and we start to look at some of the other admissions factors uh, that, that, dem that to demonstrate that they are leading to racial inequities uh, and, and, and disparities. Uh, and, and I think that's what we have to show. We have to demonstrate the outcome of these policies and be less focused on whether they have racial language or even the intent of the policymaker. Well, you talk about the outcome. Um, in California and in Michigan, uh, affirmative action was already outlawed for their public universities in the, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, actually. So black enrollment at top schools in those two states, they plummeted. It was rapidly. I believe it was about 50 percent. So let, let's talk a little bit about the broad, long-term consequences of that kind of drastic drop in representation of students of color in these institutions. Well, when, when, when Black, Latino, and Indigenous students are, are un, underrepresented, as they are at the top uh, 100 most selective institutions, that also extends into the graduate programs. Then they become underrepresented in the graduate programs. And whoever's underrepresented in the graduate programs are also likely to be under, underrepresented in the professions, like, like doctors you know, and lawyers, or, or even on the Supreme Court. And so it, it sort of filters through throughout society. When, 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 when Black and Brown and Indigenous students are, are being excluded uh, from college admissions because of the admissions factors, uh, you know, it, it's going to then lead to other elements of society. In the affirmative action ruling, the Supreme Court uh, made a carve out, an exception, if you will, for military academies. In her dissent, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson writes that the majority decided affirmative action was fine if it meant preparing, quote, underrepresented minorities for success in the bunker, not the boardroom. What do you make of this exception? I mean, it, it just goes to show uh, where. Uh, particularly uh, black people uh, and other uh, groups of color uh, are accepted. So we're, we're accepted when we're putting our lives on the line uh, for the United States. We're, we're accepted when we're entertaining people. We're accepted when we're serving people. But for whatever reason, we're not accepted when we're trying to be professionals, uh, you know, and build wealth like other groups. You know, I... It, it really strikes me that we are having this entire conversation, the Supreme Court is taking these actions that they have taken, uh, in the wake of an attack on our, teaching our nation's history. In schools all across the, the country, um, uh, there's been a, a concerted look at critical race theory, and I'm using quotes because not actually what is happening in schools across the country. Books are being banned. Um, in the summer that George Floyd was murdered, it, it really seemed like everyone was just... Your book was flying off the shelf. Everybody's trying to figure out how to be anti, anti-racist. anti Companies were hiring DEI, um, uh, opening up DEI initiatives. There were a lot of diversity dollars, as I like to call it. Uh, but three years later, uh, many of those initiatives have dried up. Uh, your books, for example, have been banned in several states, actually. And now the Supreme Court thinks we have achieved colorblindness. You've got Republican politicians celebrating it. What is what is happening here? And, and are you surprised by how far the pendulum has swung in such short amount of time? 
I think taking the long view of history, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised because when we look at American history, uh, whenever uh, we have achieved or sought to achieve uh, equity, whenever we have put in place anti-racist policies like affirmative action that have been proven uh, to close racial disparities, you know, in colleges and universities, the typical response historically, like currently, is, has been that these policies are actually the problem, that these policies are somehow uh, anti-white. And so you've had this pretty concerted movement to transform anti-racism as the real racism. And that's precisely what Jim Crow segregationists did. Uh, you had enslavers casting abolitionists as the problem. Mm. And unfortunately, that's, that's still the case today. Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, professor and founding director of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University. Appreciate your time tonight, sir. Thank you for having me.